altar, please. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before His throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. Let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout. It's always easier to come up here and wake up the church when you had a song like that. Good morning. So I, I was trying to figure out what I was going to say for today. And I uh, talked to Ora Beth this morning. And she told me to say, hey, y'all. So, hey, y'all. It's great to see everybody. Uh, I'm glad to have everybody that's here, as well as those that are online. Uh, hopefully, everybody was able to get a copy of the program. In it, you're going to find a lot of good information. Uh, Joe always puts a uh, message on the front of it. Please read that because it's always good. Inside it, you're going to find the people that need prayers, some that are sick, some that are hurting, and some that definitely need our prayers. Uh, and you'll find all the other information of activities that are going on in the church and uh, all the information that you need to know. Um, additionally, we have visitor cards in the pew in front of you. If you are a visitor, we ask that you fill those out, and you can either leave them in the seat at the end of service, or you can put them in the uh, plate when it comes around. Lastly, uh, today's the fifth Sunday of the month, so I get to be the first person to remind everybody that we have a luncheon after the service, and the thing that's holding us from getting to go to service is Joe, so, you know, we'll... No pressure. So as you get ready for that, and as we get ready for today's service, would you pray with me? Dear God, we come here today to worship and celebrate you and all that you've made in this world. We give you thanks for the many blessings that have been poured out upon us. We continue to be thankful for the rain and the cooler weather. And Lord, I ask you to allow us to receive today's message. Give us the focus to listen intently to the message and give us the wisdom to find application for our lives. Finally, apply passion to each of us so that we can spread the word and this message to those around us this week and that it glorifies your kingdom. Watch over us, guide and protect us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed. 
that thou might ransom me and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave
as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, I wanted to mention a, a few short things before we do to get our minds uh, in the right mindset. A few moments ago, we sang the song, I Gave My Life For Thee, and Joe wrote about the origin of that song in the bulletin. I encourage you to read that story and his, uh, his take on it. Hopefully mine is a little different. Uh, the first thing is that the songwriter was writing it in January in the 1800s, and it was cold. It was so cold that they needed a wood stove. And when they wrote down the words, they thought, you know what? This isn't good enough, so I'm going to throw it in the fire. So the song lyrics went into the fire, didn't catch, fell out, and uh, now we have that song today. <laughs> and the comparison is, the song's about Jesus and Jesus giving his life for us, which is just the same thing. It's Jesus pulling us from the fire. And I thought that there was a pretty strong metaphor there. I, I don't know if that's a, a good accent or if that story is even true, but uh, it, it seemed like a good one and it made sense to share it because um, there's so much that we, uh, we have to be thankful for, but most of all, it's, it's being pulled from the fire by that perfect sacrifice. So if you'd pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. And as we come together to remember your son's death on the cross and the breaking of his body, which we symbolize with the breaking of bread, we ask that you would look into our hearts, that you would purify us, that you would cleanse us of the things that we've done since the last time we came together to remember your son's death. We thank you that that perfect sacrifice was made for us and that we can have a hope of a home with you in heaven. And we ask that you look after us and that you continue to bless us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. So the other part of that that I didn't mention the first time I was up here is that the songwriter thought the lyrics were no good. And yet, um, I didn't say that we were no good when Jesus died for us. Uh, the comparison here now that I want to talk about is that Jesus died for an undeserving people, but it was a perfect sacrifice. And in Hebrews 10, the writer of Hebrews talks about the difference between the Old Testament sacrifices and the New. 
And in the Old Testament, the sacrifices were ongoing. They were daily. They were exhausting. I bet the priests smelled kind of like people working the pits of barbecues, you know, all the time. You could probably tell who they were uh, just by getting downwind of them. And it still wasn't good enough. It needed to keep being done over and over, day after day. Year after year, there needed to be a, a goat sent out into the, the wilderness to be reminded that the sins are just being carried forward. But the one perfect sacrifice, there was no more need for another. And that's what we're going to uh, remember with Jesus spilling the blood as we partake in the, the fruit of the body. So if you pray with me, please. Again, Father, we come before you and we thank you for the blood that was spilt for our account. We remember the suffering of Jesus and we, we celebrate his death until he comes here. We ask that you bless us if we, as we partake. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Might have gotten you up here a second too early, so I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you. I spoke with Joe right before uh, coming up here, so I wanted to make sure I didn't step on what uh, he was going to talk about in his sermon, uh, talking about the song. And he said, when you get up here, just fair warning, if you say this is a convenient time that we've set aside to give, I might pick on you. Um, and it was a good warning. The problem is that I've sat here for the last 15 minutes or so, and I can't come up with anything else to say instead of it. <laughs> so here we are. Um, the Lord's Supper is concluded. We have been blessed beyond measure. Uh, I, I think about it even when stuff breaks. I've got a broken refrigerator at home and a part on the way, but um, I've got a refrigerator to fix. I've got cold food in a cooler, but uh, I've got dents in my roof too, but I've got a roof over my head. And these are little piddly things. These have nothing to do with what I really have, which is I've got a Savior. I've got a hope for heaven. And even if all those things break, I'm still going to have that. So uh, this is our, our chance to, to further the work here um, by you know, donating our money, uh, by giving um, our material goods back for the things that we've gotten that are worth far more. So if you pray with me. Our Father, we're so blessed. 
Uh, we're blessed beyond measure, uh, both in material things and in spiritual things. And as we take this time to, to give back a portion of what we've made, uh, we ask that you would bless these funds, that they would uh, be put to good use and that they would come back tenfold. And we're thankful for your son and his sacrifice for making it possible that we, we have a reason to do it. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise, O oh, Holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing, great are you. I gotta, I gotta say, Joe is usually right on the spot, but on fifth Sunday, when there's food waiting, he chose a, a lawyer to do communion and a known long-winded bag me to do the prayer. <laughs> so either he didn't have much for the sermon today, or he really messed up. <laughs> but, but if I go long, just remember it's him, not me. So. And. But I would like to say, is it not wonderful to see a new person step up and do communion? And I think we take for granted our fellowship that we have in the Church of Christ and this tradition we've been handed. But how great is it to see different men step up and give different thoughts? And I don't know, it does my heart joy. But thank you very much. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to you this morning, we just want to take a moment to realize how great you are. May we remind ourselves that 
the more we learn about this box that we live in, the more we understand about the creation of the world, the more it seems like it was created from one spark, from one point, from your word. Lord, we, we take a moment to realize how majestic that is and to realize how powerful the, the evidence of your love, the evidence of who you are is in the creation around us. We pray that we never worship the created, but we always worship the creator. Lord, this morning we just give you thanks for the fellowship that we're part of, for the men that have chosen to lead, and the men who have been chosen to lead. We thank you for their heart of service, and for the women that do so much. We thank you for the joy of their love. May we learn, may we see, and may we grow in their example. Lord, we would ask this morning that you would forgive us for all those moments where we fall short of your glory. And Lord, whenever judgment arises in us to be passed on others, may we realize that we stand on the pedestals and the ladders of those who came before us and that we all started in a place here where we have a foundation that allows us to see truth to allow us, us to see your truth. And for all those around us who don't have that truth, may we not pass judgment on them thinking that we ourselves are better. But may we realize that if they don't have the truth, then that's judgment on us because that means we may have not shared it yet. Give us the heart to be the ones that can share. Give us the strength to have a sword that we can sheathe because, Lord, when you said the meek shall inherit the earth, you did not mean the weak. Please let us understand that you want us to be strong and you want us to be mighty. But you want us to restrain our strength and our might, knowing that we can show love because we don't need to win for ourselves, Lord. It is your will, your wisdom, your way that we wish to carry through in this world. For in your son's Jesus Christ name, we come and we ask these things and we give thanks. Amen. This morning I'll be reading both 2 Corinthians 8-9 and Matthew 10-8. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely you give. Our let's all please stand as we sing this song. <laughs> God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He
Good morning. We uh, greet every one of you uh, who are near and far in this room and those that are joining us from a distance, and we're thankful for your presence today. And um, It's a little bit scattered out for our regular lunch day, but we have a number of visitors with us, so you came on a great day. Uh, if you are visiting with us, we hope you will be able to join us for uh, the lunch that you've already been warned about that follows. Um, I've been warned several times, and so I'd better get going with the business at hand because uh, evidently my clock is ticking. Um, I actually got up here at a very good time today, so I, we're we're in good shape, I think. For one thing, I mentioned, uh, like Roger did, I, Travis did a fantastic job with uh, leading us at Lord's Table, so Travis, thank you for that. I appreciate that very much. And one thing he alluded to uh, in that uh, was that I was going to mention, I'll just, I'll just flat out tell you, uh, I, I'm going to talk for just a moment about the placement of our time of giving back to God, our, our collection or whatever we habitually call uh, our taking up an offering uh, on the Lord's Day. There was a time, and I, I, I mentioned these words to him, there was a time I was very uncomfortable uh, when when folks would get up at the time of offering, and, and in Churches of Christ, probably 99% of the time, and I and that may be a gross generalization, but great lot of the time it comes right after the Lord's Supper, right? And um, someone would say something like, now, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, as a convenient time, we'll have our collection. And, you know, that used to kind of bother me because uh, any time it sounds like we're denigrating in importance any part of our worship uh, before God, and, and giving is an act of worship, uh, giving back is an act of worship, um, that wording was on the screen, I think, a little a little while ago, and it is it is true. Um, I'm glad in our fellowship, even though I think all of us know that when Paul referenced a collection that he was gathering for a special purpose in First Corinthians 16, he was not giving a once a, a, a for all time command that every Lord's Day, every congregation of the Lord's people has to take up an offering. I think we're aware of that, yet I'm very glad, I, I'm very glad that our fellowship, that we do include every Lord's Day, the opportunity for folks who wish to give back, because it's a good reminder of its importance um, in our relationship with God. But there are several schools of thought out there, you're aware of this, of what's most important in in the worship, as we gather together, there's some one school of thought that says, well, this moment, the moment of the message, the sermon hour, don't worry, this is not going to be an hour, that's just an expression, um, that that's the peak moment of our worship. Well, I, you know, I don't believe that. I'm, I'm not nearly egotistical enough to tell you that's true. Um, I just don't agree with that. There's another school of thought that says, well, the peak moment, the most important thing we do is the Lord's Supper. And that is vitally important. It, it is crucial that we do this each and every Lord's Day. But yet, I think we ought to be careful. I think if Jesus would stand here, He'd say, no, not necessarily. I don't want you to denigrate any part of worship or lift up any part necessarily above any other. If you're into music, what are you going to say? Those that love music are going to say, the singing, that's the most important part of the worship. I think Jesus would say, all of it is crucial. All of it is important. We can't lift one part up above uh, the other, nor should we. Um, and that's that's what I'm cautioning here. And and maybe. Maybe to highlight the importance of giving, and, and by the way, one or more uh, of our shepherds have suggested this, maybe we should have a special place of its own in the service, uh, different from where it is. But 
I, I have come back around to thinking that in one way of looking at it, there's no better time for us to think about giving than right after we have pondered and prayed about and praised our Lord Jesus for His sacrificially giving His all on the cross in the Lord's Supper, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, we honor Him in the Lord's Supper for all He gave, and then we say by extending the opportunity to give, now it's our turn to show in a tangible way how grateful we are for everything the Lord has done and all He's made possible for us. We've been looking this month at, at the generosity of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, and noting that this is one, one way, one of the ways by which we can be more conformed to His image, uh, model after Him. And, and what better way to wrap this than kind of turn it around this morning and ask, when it's our turn to give, how are we doing? How are we doing? We sang it as that question earlier, that song that uh, Travis mentioned and I mentioned in the bulletin. It, it, it was so ingrained for many years as kind of the go-to communion song, right? Right on, one of, one of the big go-to communion songs uh, uh, to be used on Sunday morning. But it asked that convicting question, I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? Some folks seem to be good at asking, what has the church or what has the Lord done for me lately? And when they have within themselves the perception of, well, not, not so much, uh, I think that serves as rationale for them to seldom show up for worship with the church or, or that they get involved in the church only to a small extent. Seems like I remember a universal rule of reciprocity that Paul gave his audience in Galatia, don't you? In chapter 6 of his letter to the Galatians, Paul said, A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. What's the universal principle there? A person is going to get out of something in direct proportion to what they put in. So if you're not getting much out of church, or if you come to worship, you're not getting much out of worship, quite often it means you're not investing much in it. Of course, along with that principle was Paul's extended point there after that first word, that if you're only investing in earthly Physical returns, that's all you're going to have a right to expect in the end. But if you invest in treasures in heaven, then that's where your reward is going to be found in the end. But back to the you get out what you put in principle. That's, that's true, right? Not just for church life. That's true in almost any situation. You can apply that across the board. You, put, you get out of something what you invest into it. Uh, it's, it's just common sense. But here's the kicker that folks tend to miss. Asking the Lord questions like, oh, Lord, what have you done for me lately? That, that's a double-edged sword that cuts both ways. The reason I say that is when one decides to become a disciple of Jesus, you remember what Jesus said was involved? Self-denial. Remember, denying self, taking up your cross, and following me. That's what's involved in being a disciple going all in for Him, fully invested in kingdom concerns. Keep in mind, when we ask those kinds of questions, what have you done for me? That He is watching, and it's as if He's asking every disciple on a regular basis, what have you done for me lately? How are you investing? Not just your money, now that's a big part of it, but your time, your talents, your opportunities, how much of all of that are you investing in me and for the sake of the kingdom? So for the rest of the time this morning, I want to look at some timeless principles concerning how we're to give back to God, because it is our turn. He 
graciously gave the initiative and gave and sacrificed all that He did for us through Jesus. Now it's our turn. It's our turn to answer back to Him and His, and His grace. And I am going to specifically talk about monetary giving from here on out. Now it is true that you know the Lord wants all of us, every bit of us, it's all inclusive. Our time, our monies, our talents, our resources, everything. But what I'm afraid of is sometimes we kind of make that a general slogan. Yes, God wants all of me. And we kind of gloss over the financial part, the monetary part. And we say, well, He doesn't necessarily need our money. Be careful there because, you know, we're not talking about need. Don't make the mistake the Lord needs anything that you have. He doesn't. But He wants, that's a different word there, He wants all of you and me and anyone who's put Him on as Lord in baptism because it's a statement of trust. That we acknowledge that now it's all His. Uh, and we're just managers of it for a short while. Our talents, our abilities, and yes, also our monies. It's like the, the uh, this just came to me. The uh, <clears throat> guy who was going to be baptized in the creek and the preacher was about to get it done and he said, wait a minute. I hadn't taken my wallet out. And he says, eh, that's okay. We need to baptize that too. Um, it all belongs to him from that point forward. Um, and he's the owner of it all and we joyfully return back to him on a regular basis as our way of expressing thanks for all he's given us, especially in saving us through the sacrifice of His Son. When you think about it, why would anyone who is truly grateful not want to regularly give back? Do you hear that statement? Why would anyone truly grateful not want to give back? It's almost as if they're saying when they don't that they're not really all that grateful. That's what it comes down to. Okay, first of all, I think it should free us up in our giving, to understand from the start, as I've been talking about here, what truly happens when we give is we're just returning to God what's rightfully His and to know that He owns it all anyway. We're going to sing in a few moments the old song, another old song, We Give Thee But Thine Own. Uh, and the point of that song is it's already His. Anyway, we're just returning it back to Him. We're acknowledging that stewardship is all about the willingness to give back to God generously of what He's simply entrusting to our care for a little while. He's trusting us to make the best use of it for Him, for kingdom purposes, if, if we've been redeemed and are ourselves part of God's kingdom. David said this so powerfully when he was asking Israel to gather some monies to finish paying for all it would be needed to build Solomon's temple. He'd gathered gold and silver and some other precious materials, but he needed some more funding. And so he asked for that, and the people answered back in, in an enormously generous way. This is in First Chronicles 29, beginning in verse 10. We see David's response is a prayer to God because of the generosity of the people. It, uh, it makes him pray this prayer to God in, in praise to Him. It says, David, bless God in full view of the entire congregation. Blessed are you, God of Israel, our Father from of old and forever. To you, O God, belong the greatness and the might and the glory and the victory and the majesty, the splendor. Yes, everything in heaven, everything on earth, the kingdom is all yours. You've raised yourself high over all. Riches and glory come from you. You're ruler over all. You hold strength and power in the palm of your hand. Build up and strengthen all. And here we are, O oh God, our God, giving thanks to you. We praise your splendid name. And then this is the real clincher that I want you to hear in verse 14. 
But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Isn't that great? David says, we're not giving. We're giving back because we acknowledge it's all yours to start with. And that helps us when thinking about this idea of giving back to God. This acknowledgement that it, it all belongs to Him. We're just holding on to a little bit in trust for a while. Another principle that's huge here is the recognition that God does not want. In fact, He will not accept offerings given back to Him that represent our seconds or something that's left over or even some excess that we decide to give Him because there's nothing else we can think of to do with it. And, and we need the tax break, so we put it in the plate. Or we put it online. However, we, however you choose to do that. Fast forward with me in Israel's story from the glory days of First Chronicles 29, which we just read, when people gave so freely and generously, recognizing it was all the Lord's anyway, from that to the days of the last Old Testament prophet Malachi. And you'll notice things had kind of gone downhill from one point to the other. Now, granted, the exile was already long over. People had long been reestablished back in Israel. They, they again, though, started to take God for granted. They again became apathetic in their relationship with God. They were being unjust towards each other. They were breaking faith in their marriages. They were robbing God of His proper due regarding tithes and offerings. They were trying to pawn off their rejected, their sick, lame animals to God in their animal sacrifice. God said through the prophet in chapter 1, you know, try offering those to your governor. Uh, each region had a, a governor over them. Try offering those to him as your tribute to him. He won't accept that, and neither do I accept that from you. When in Mark chapter 12, and I'm going to be referring back to this one quite a bit in the next few minutes, when in that chapter Jesus holds up the example, you remember, of a little widow lady to His disciples as a prime example of the way in which we're to give back to God. You remember the little dig that Jesus gets in on the religious elites who put in their large sums of money? He said, they've put in out of their excess, their leftovers. But she, she has given everything all she had to live on. That's Mark 12, verse 44. God doesn't want us to give back out of our excess or out of things we don't want or don't know what else to do with. He wants our first and our best. He wants His taken off the top, so to speak. Because He will accept no place but first place when it comes to our giving back. We need to understand that. Another important principle here is attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. We hear, you know, self help gurus and counselors and all say that, but it's true in regards to this issue of giving back to God. How do you propose to give back? Grudgingly? Kind of like, you know, does someone have to pull it out? Oh, you know, I, I know I should, but I'm, I'm, I'm in a bind now. I'm saving up for something. Once I get over the hump, you know, once I get that obligation taken care of, then I'll do it. Uh, th then I'll give. Or maybe, maybe you do it out of a show of piety. Um, when I reflected on Charles Turk's story last week that he told at the time of offering, you remember that? When, uh, as a boy, he threw some coins in a guy's bucket and had the guy tell him, you rang my bell. Love that story. But I was drawn again to thinking about the little lady in Mark 12 
and, and those who gave their large sums. And it makes you wonder, since those large sums, these were about eight or ten large papered uh, containers that were in the outer court, the, the court of women actually, because that's the farthest they could go in, into the temple precincts, um, that were lined up there in which people gave back to God. But the amounts, and it would have been all coins, by the way. They didn't deal in paper. So it would have made a loud noise. You know, the large amounts that these guys put in. And so I wonder if part of that was just giving for show. Were they just, in a sense, going for a, you rang my bell from God, right? In Matthew 6, verse 2, you recall in His Sermon on the Mount, Jesus assures us, if that's our motive for giving, if that's our attitude when we give, we might as well not do it. Because such a gift is not acceptable to God. And it will not secure for us a place with Him. No, the gifts God accepts are those that are offered from glad, joyful, thankful hearts. Hearts that are excited to give. Hearts like those Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 9. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. There's that principle again. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Another principle that has to be stated here, and this is so important, is that proportion matters to God over portion. Let me say that again. The proportion with which we give matters to God more than the portion with which we give. When God saw the large amounts that the powerful put in, as opposed to the two tiniest coins that, that were given by the little lady in Mark 12. By the way, the value of those were less than, much less than one one hundredth of a cent. Okay? In other words, it didn't get much less of monetary value that this little lady put in. But Jesus dismissed the rich givers. And He praised the lady. Can you imagine the reaction of the disciples? I can imagine their eyes getting big when they are sitting there watching and hearing and seeing those big amounts that the, the big time spenders are putting in and their eyes getting bigger and Jesus says, ah, don't pay attention to that. I want you to look at this lady over here. And they can't hear anything. They're like, I didn't hear anything. Did, did she put something in? What did she do? What, what's the big deal about her? Jesus draws her attention to this lady because proportionally she gave way enormously more than these guys who gave out of their excess. He knew the rich givers, what they owned, what they possessed, what they had within their power to give, and yet they didn't. There was no sacrifice involved for them. It was a mere moral obligation combined with, I think, again, only Jesus could judge that, I can't, but perhaps combined with the idea of wanting to be heard or seen. Whereas for the little lady, it was sacrificial. It hurt her to give what she did. It placed her exactly where God wanted her to be. Exactly where He wants you and I to be in a position of being completely dependent on Him. Trusting completely in Him. Giving to the extent that 
we can't do anything else but rely on Him for what comes next. And that's what she did. That's the position in which she placed herself when she gave those two tiniest of coins. So here's the deal. If you give back what you believe is a small amount, and, and you're embarrassed by that, if it's still a relatively large proportion of what you have available to give, don't be embarrassed by it. Because God is pleased by proportion over portion. And if you give like that, if you give when it, when it hurts, when you really have other obligations that you need to be honoring, but you honor God first, I guarantee you, He will make sure that you have enough or more the next time to give again. He will honor your trust. That's how it works. But beware, the other side of it is true as well. If you're just giving God a token of what you're really able and blessed to give, He's not going to honor that. In that moment, you should be ashamed. Not for giving too little when you don't have it to give, but for giving too little when you are capable of giving so much more. And I say that not, not to pick on anyone. It's, I will tell you, and I love when I get a chance to say this, per capita, this has always been, for the almost 20 years that we've been blessed to be with this church family, this has always been one of the most generous congregations, bodies of God's people I've seen anywhere. And our, our budget is bigger, consistently bigger, by the way, than churches that have a lot more folks in them. And giving consistently better than a lot of those. But this is a principle that God puts forward that He wants us to be, uh, of which He wants us to be aware. Okay, I'll end with this one. And it's a principle that you only realize, you only understand when you give back generously. And that is, you can't outgive God. Amen? God challenged the folks in Malachi's day after telling them to bring the whole tithe into his storehouse so that he would be honored. He adds this. He says, test me in this and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there'll not be room enough to store it. Jesus promised his disciples, and though I think in the context of Luke 6.38, I think he was talking specifically there about giving grace and mercy to people, granting the benefit of the doubt that we talked about earlier this month. But I think it can still apply to our monetary giving as well. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That is a principle you can take to the bank. No, no pun intended. But the principle of reciprocity showed up again there, didn't it? Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And I found time and time again in my own life that when I increase my level of giving back to God, I've been blessed to be able to later on increase it again. And later on increase it again. And increase it again. It's a, it's a self-perpetuating thing. But it starts with letting go. And resolving to please God and giving back to Him and demonstrating good stewardship of all the things God owns, but yet for a brief time, in trust to you. Let's see the times that we have to get back, give back to God, not just as a time of convenience or obligation or duty, but as times of 
that we desire, that we delight in, in pleasing Him, in bringing Him honor and glory, even in our times of giving back. To God be the glory and the praise and the honor. Let's live like and give back like we believe, truly believe, that it all belongs to Him. And we're just holding on to a little piece of it that He's entrusted for a while. Let's build treasures in heaven where we don't have to worry about stuff that happens here on earth, but we know uh, where it's going. If you have a need to bring before your church family this morning, make it known now. I was thinking. We give thee but thine own, whatever thy gift may be, all that we have is thine alone, I trust, O Lord, from thee. May we thy bounties thus, as to morning. It's my honor this morning to bring to you on behalf of the shepherds a welcome and we thank you for, for being here. If you're visiting, please stay and be our guest for lunch. We'd love to have you. And Joe, thank you for your message this morning. I just wanted to remind us a couple of things. Uh, don't forget, we have folks, several families who are bereaved recently let's continue to remember them in our prayers uh, and I on that note I have a note here that I'd like to read to you dear church family thank you so much for all the beautiful cards text and most of all prayers the love you have shown my family during the loss of my mother will never be forgotten of Sherry Tommy Todd and Brooke Bailey not only uh, the Baileys, but the Pharaohs shared in that loss. Let's be sure and remember them. I think I uh, would remind you also of our sick. We have a large number that are on our prayer list. And add to that our missionaries, please. Remember them and the hardship that they go through to serve the Lord. The only thing else that I wanted to remind you this morning was about Wednesday nights. If you haven't been coming, you're really missing out. Every week, our numbers are getting bigger and bigger. It's, it's just been a wonderful time to get together, have a meal together, and then join together in singing. And it's just, it's a fun and joyful time. So if you haven't been here, come and give that a try on Wednesday night. It's, it will be a blessing to you. I think I've covered everything I wanted to do. Once again, visitors, if you'd come and be our guest today at lunch, we'd be honored. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that You've blessed us so abundantly. Father, we thank You that You give to us more than we give to You. All that we have is Yours, a gift from You. Father, thank You for loving us so much. Help us, Father, to be generous in giving, not only of our money, but, Father, of our time, of our effort. Help us to serve You joyfully. 
Help us to look for others who need to hear the good news. Father, thank You for blessing this church family. Bless those that are sick and those who have lost loved ones, Father. We thank You now for this time that we've had to be together to worship You. And we give You thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Very brief, I want to put a picture up on the, the screen here, please. Aren't those some good looking kids? We've got some great kids here, and, and so we had our first date night, lift group date night, a couple of nights ago, uh, and this is something we started doing last year, and it just went so well, we wanted to keep it going, because we believe that husbands and wives, especially those that still have kids at home, it's just so important for them to continue to spend time together as husband and wife without the kids. And all of us know that, right? Just how important that is. So this is definitely a ministry we wanted to continue to do for our Lyft group. And I'll go ahead and tell you, the, the Lyft group members who have already taken advantage of this and have used this, they've all already told me they are more than happy to be on the list, the rotation to host these so that every everyone else can take part in it. But I just wanted to give the whole church an opportunity. I've got a sign-up sheet in the back. If anybody would like to help out with these, it's usually the, the, the last Friday night of every month. Now, next month, because we had another conflict, it'll be the third Friday night. But after that, fourth Friday night, always in the AC from 5 to 9. Uh, even some of the older youth group might be able to help out, and, and they are a huge help. So I just wanted to give this opportunity to any others who, who wanted to help out with hosting one of these each month. Uh, I, I think it'd be, I know it'd be much appreciated by our, our younger couples. Uh, and I think it'd be a blessing to you also to, to get to spend some more time with our sweet kids that we have here and get to know them just a little bit better. Let's all stand together, please. There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come when I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done? Is that His voice I am hearing? Come away, my precious one. Is He calling? Let's go enjoy some fellowship. Oh,